hopefully everybody can see that there. Let me just turn to our front page. All right, so um, you will notice that we uh, have a, a slightly prettier face than Laurie's on our cover page today. Um, today we're going to have a guest speaker, um, Jessica Smith, who is joining us, and I'll introduce her very shortly. Um, on the screen there you will see her email details um, and Jessica is more than happy for you to contact her at any time um, if you have any queries around copyright which is what she's going to be talking to us about today. All right, so <clears throat> kia ora and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today as we take a first look at Promethean's award-winning cloud-based software platform Classflow. If you haven't explored Classflow yet, let me give you a very, very brief explanation of it. It's essentially a cloud-based software that allows teachers and students to create lesson content. They can do this collaboratively if they wish to, kind of in a similar way to how you'd work on a Google Doc online. Uh, this lesson content can then be pushed out to students in the classroom via any computer or mobile device that can be connected to the lesson through a web browser, and that does include mobile phones. Teachers can take advantage of inbuilt polling options or questioning options, so real-time assessment or formative assessment, as we probably term it, can be used to drive or change the lesson for students as needed. Uh, results from this polling can also be saved for post-lesson analysis or for record keeping. Um, Classo started out as an idea to provide users with some basic whiteboarding software capabilities and polling options in the cloud. And it has evolved into the entirety that it is today. Um, there are so many features in Classflow and we simply don't have enough time to cover even a smidgen of them today. Um, so we're mainly going to focus on some simple but useful elements that should at least get you up and running with Classflow if you want to give it a go in your own classroom. Um, here's our agenda today and as you can see as part of this webinar we're going to be looking at some of the recent changes to Promethean websites, in particular the merging of the Promethean Planet website into the Classflow website. And this is where we're actually going to start today, mainly because we probably have a lot of active Inspire users um, out there who might be in a bit of a mild panic with the Planet website seemingly um, disappearing, but I promise you it has not disappeared, it has merged. Okay, so let's just have a little look see at our web browser here. So if you go to the Promethean Planet website now, you'll see this landing page which is pretty much redirecting you to the Classflow website. Let me just move this recorder out of our way. Um, please be reassured that you can still find all of the things you loved on planet have just been relocated. So let's have a look and see. Um, now for a long time, even if you went to download uh, Active Inspire from Promethean Planet, when you clicked on the link, it took you out to the support site. And um, same thing here. Okay, so this will look familiar to you if you've downloaded Active Inspire. That's where Planet was redirecting you to anyway. And the same for getting support from your products on that same support website, um, the landing page there, you have always been able to uh, find information and get support uh, for about mm, probably over a year now. So uh, that's not really especially different. Um, you, you might have used the links on Planet to get there, but that's where you've been finding the stuff anyway. So over here, um, this is where we will go if we've accidentally come to the Promethean Planet website. Um, it's redirecting us to where we can find all of those lovely old resources like the flip charts or um, assessments or uh, PDF documents and things like that that were on Promethean Planet under the resources tab. So if I click on this, it's going to take us to Classflow and it's going to take us to the Classflow marketplace. Okay. Now, if I was to do a quick search 
here and let's just say I'm going to search the keyword fractions. If I was to scroll down, you're going to see heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps and heaps of resources. We've got screeds of them. These pages will go on and on and on. Okay, it will search for every single resource that is on the class flow marketplace with the keyword fractions. That's old resources and new. And all of the ones you're going to see first are the new resources. These um, are called lessons, and this is the symbol for them here. Hopefully, you can see my mouse cursor there. Um, these are in the format that is ready for the lesson to be delivered through the Classflow platform, if you will. Okay, let's really quickly just grab one of these. So I'm just going to click on this, just so we can have a little look at the new resources. Don't worry, I'm taking you to the old ones too. Um, as you can see, I'm not logged into Classflow. If I want to log in, I can log in here. Or if I don't have an account, I can sign up for free. Now, back on this Promethean Planet homepage, it tells you down the bottom that you can log in with your Promethean Planet login. I will go into that in detail in a moment. All right, but at the moment, I'm not logged into Classflow. I've literally just clicked on that link. If I want to download this resource to use and play within Classflow, I obviously have to log into it to add it to my resources, and it tells me that in this blue box. In Classflow, you're looking for these lovely blue boxes. They tend to give you a, a big clue as to where you need to hit next. Um, and also, they often have hover over functionality. So I'm going to click on that, and I'm going to type my password. Now, if you are using your Promethean Planet credentials, something to note, in this box here, it, it says username or, or email address. Don't use your Planet username. You must use the email address that you signed up to Promethean Planet with. If you're like me and you have about 10 email accounts and you don't know which one you signed up with, it's really simple to uh, sign up now for free. You can just hit that button there. In fact, let's have a little look at it. We're obviously going to sign up as a teacher. It's a really simple box. Okay, very easy. Oops, go back one more. Okay, just log in. There we go. Now, everything worked perfectly today when I did my run through, so let's hope the internet's being my friend for the rest of the day. And you can see here now I've got the option I can add this to my resources. Now, I'm also logged into Classflow. I can tell that because it's got my initials up here. And I can see all of these tabs open here. And you'll notice that one of those tabs is called My Resources. So when I'm clicking here, that's where this resource is going to download to. OK, here's my little blue message that's telling me that that's downloading. And hopefully it's going to be nice and quick. <coughs> Excuse me. Must have chosen a big one. This area here that it's taken us to, there we go, successfully added, um, is a bit of a preview. So I could have come through and had a look at all of the thumbnails here. And you can see that these are quite nicely made resources. Uh, these ones have all been made by the Classflow uh, team. All right, so I'm not going to uh, go in and have a look at the, the resource in my resources yet because I want to go back to the marketplace and show you where to get the old resources. All right, so let's click there. I'm going to do my fractions keyword again. And let's talk a little bit about the marketplace. Actually, I was meant to introduce Jessica before I did all this, but never mind. I'll go off on this tangent, and then I'll introduce you, Jessica. Um, You'll notice that there is an aspect of uh, the marketplace now saying free or paid. Um, essentially, the marketplace is a shop for resources, but don't worry, there's still millions of free resources in here. The difference is that there is a market element available, as the name suggests, 
where teachers can buy other people's resources, but also where they can sell their own resources. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. So let's say I want free resources. And I'm going to scroll down, 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 right to the bottom of the marketplace landing page. And if I open this, you'll see all of the different types of files that were available for download from Promethean Planet um, are now available uh, here through the marketplace. Okay, so let me click search up here by my keyword, and there are all the fraction um, flip charts that are available for free. So I'll quickly click on one of these, and we'll just have a look. You can see here all of the same information we used to uh, see on Planet. If anyone's reviewed it, we can see their reviews, the number of times it's been viewed, the number of times it was downloaded, who created it. Often there's a name here. Um, and of course I can scroll through here as well. Now, I'm going to stop talking there and I'll jump back in after I've introduced um, Jessica. So I thought this was quite prudent to have Jessica join us um, today. Jessica is a senior officer with the National Copyright Unit here in Australia. Um, and now for our Kiwi teachers joining us today, whilst we're going to be talking about Australian copyright issues and laws, I suspect it's not going to be hugely different for you guys across the ditch, but it should give you food for thought, if nothing else. Um, so without further ado, given that we now have a marketplace where potentially teachers can buy and sell resources, this could be something we need to uh, be a little bit um, aware of. So I am going to, oh, I don't know what that's doing, I'm going to stop sharing my desktop, or oh, no I'm not, I'm going to, there we go, make Jessica the presenter. Uh, right. Okay, so that should be passing to you, Jessica. You might need to unmute yourself there. Okay, hello, everyone. Thanks, Claire. Let me try to get my screen shared. Okay. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah, we can see that. Okay, great. So thanks, Claire. Sorry, I've got a dog in the background. Hopefully he'll be quiet. So as Claire said, I'm Jessica Smith from the National Copyright Unit. We're responsible for copyright policy and administration at Australian school and TAFE sector, and this involves mostly three very broad activities. We manage the obligations under the educational copyright licenses for here in Australian schools which we're going to discuss today. We advocate for better copyright laws on the school and TAFE sector's behalf. We also educate the school and TAFE sector regarding their copyright responsibilities. And we mainly do this through our presentations, our website, um, an online course that we offer, and advice calls and emails. And I'll touch more on this information um, at the end of the presentation. So in this short presentation today, we're going to blitz through three areas, what copyright covers, what you can do with copyright material, and some copy, smart copying tips. And today is, like I said, a very short presentation, so I'm just going to touch on these topics, and at the end I'll mention where you can get some additional information. So very quickly, copyright covers two very broad areas, what's called works, which are artistic, literary, musical, and dramatic works, and then what's called other subject matter, which is your films, sound recordings, broadcasts, and published editions. So copyright has the potential to cover a lot of different material types. And copyright in essence gives the copyright owner the right to do exclusively three activities, copy, perform, and communicate to the public the copyright material. So at one point in time, these three activities were relatively straightforward, but in today's technological and digital world, these activities have expanded to include an array of activities. So at one point in time, copying meant going to a photocopier and making a copy. But now it also includes 
scanning, downloading, uploading, printing, saving to various devices. And then the performance activity covers playing films and sound recordings in class, reading a book or a poem, playing instruments. And the most recently added copyright activity is what's called a communication, which is when you make something available to students online, you email it to students or other teachers, or you display something in the classroom. So here I'm going to quickly just take a second to kind of talk about copyright ownership, which is what Claire was talking about earlier with the new marketplace. So remember, copyright gives the owner the exclusive right to do certain activities with copyright material. So of course, it's important to first understand who the owner is. And this can get tricky in employment situations, but in most circumstances, employment contracts will state that any materials created by an employee during their course of employment will belong to the employer. So this is especially relevant in today's world, digital world, and with websites like Marketplace that allow teachers to sell the resources that they create. But in most situations, if a teacher creates something um, as part of their employment, so for their class, these resources will almost always belong to their employer. So it's more of a contractual issue rather than a copyright issue, but it is certainly something to understand. So what we've covered so far is what copyright actually covers. And probably learned that it covers a wide array of materials and activities, and you might be nervous about what you've been doing in the classroom, but luckily there are educational exceptions and licenses that allow teachers to do a lot with copyright material without needing to seek permission from the individual copyright owners. These are statutory licenses, and we're going to quickly go through two of them today. Voluntary licenses, which cover music use in Australian classrooms. Um, we don't have time to cover that today, but we have a lot of information on our website about this. And then there are two free exceptions in the Copyright Act for teachers that we're going to talk about. So the first statutory license is called the Statutory Text and Artistic Works License, which allows teachers to copy and communicate all text and artistic, artistic works for educational purposes subject to copying limits. And the copying limits um, generally restrict teachers to copying and communicating what is called a readable portion in the Copyright Act but everyone has agreed that this is the 10% or one chapter rule, which I find that most teachers generally know. Um, it varies depending on subject matter, but the general rule is 10% or one chapter, whichever is greater, greater of a resource, is what schools are certainly allowed to copy under the Copyright Act. The next statutory license is a statutory broadcast license, which covers the copying and communication of TV and radio broadcasts, as well as TV and radio from a broadcaster's website, if it has been previously broadcast on free to air. What this license doesn't cover is online TV or radio, which has, which has not been broadcast. And the two big, biggest examples that we get asked about almost on a daily basis are Netflix and YouTube. So those are not covered by the statutory broadcast license, but they are covered by what's called Section 28, which is a free exception in the Copyright Act. And it allows schools to perform and communicate materials in class. It doesn't permit copying, only playing of the content. So essentially pushing play. It doesn't permit you to download anything, download a YouTube clip, but it does allow you to play it from the internet. And so the most common examples of this is whenever teachers play online, um, anything online, so YouTube or Netflix, or if you're playing a film in class or a sound recording in class. All that's covered under Section 28, and it's free. The next exception is what's called Section 200 AB, with flexible dealing. This allows schools to copy and make limited use of copyright material for educational instruction if the use satisfies a number of criteria. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time today to actually discuss all the different criteria, but there's a lot of information on our website. And the most common activities involved with this exception is format shifting VHS tapes into DVDs whenever the VHS tapes um, aren't available in electronic format. And then also recently we've gotten a few advice inquiries about creating audiobooks. And so a teacher reading a book and they want to make a copy of that and use it um, in, late, in later educational um, reasons. And so that's all covered by Section 28 if you can satisfy, or Section 200 AD if you can satisfy the criteria. Smart copying tips. So these are just tips that we encourage schools to use. And these are important because they reduce copyright fees and they also the chance to reduce what we consider infringement risk, so chances of a school actually being sued for copyright infringement. So we say link or embed wherever possible. These activities are outside the Copyright Act, so there are no copyright concerns associated with them. 
label your school material. If your school owns material or you have specific permission to use the material in certain manners, label it. That way your school won't be paying again to use it under copyright licenses. Um, and you don't have to worry about any type of infringement. So obviously you have the permission to use it or you actually own it. So limit access to copyright material. So first, all materials copied under the copyright licenses or exceptions that I've quickly covered, um, they have to be kept behind a password protected system. And so limiting access and keeping it behind that system is a, is a mandatory requirement. And then secondly, the material should be limited to the students who actually need the resource. So remember, having something available online for students to access is considered communication, which is a copyright activity. So only have the resource available to the students who actually need it. Clear out content. So we always encourage schools and teachers to archive any material that is not currently being used. So by archive, we mean only have a the one teacher or a librarian have access to it. So either put it in an external hard drive, um, or on a personal folder on a specific laptop. Just don't have it up online so that students and others can actually access. And consider using open educational resources. These are also known as OER. And these resources have been licensed openly. So the copyright owner, the creator of the resource, has decided to license these openly to the world at large. Um, so they aren't subject to restrictions associated to the copyright licenses and exceptions that we've discussed. And the most common openly open license is what's called Creative Commons, and there's a different suite of licenses. Um, and they essentially allow you to use it for any purpose, besides they might list certain things, so for instance, non-commercial. Um, but they all allow for non-educational use, and you can use the entire resource, and you don't have to keep it behind a password protected system. So it is substantially easier to use open educational resources as opposed to the resources under the statutory licenses. So we have heaps of information on our website about these resources as well as where to find them. Last but not least, um, some information on where to find additional information on what we've discussed today. So we have our own website. It's called the Smart Copying website. It has heaps of information about all of our national copyright licenses here in Australia, as well as exceptions and open educational resources and creative commons. And we also give a lot of presentations to the school and tape staff during the Departments of Education. We put all of our presentations on our slide share page. Um, you can either write that down quickly, or I believe Claire, Claire said that this will be available for everyone after the presentation. Um, or alternatively, you can always use Google Slide Share National Copyright Unit. This will be the first thing that pops up. We also run a Copyright for Educators course. Um, this is a course that starts on October 24th, and enrollment's open on over 17. Um, the course usually fills within 24 hours, so if you're keen, be sure to sign up on the 17th. It's a seven-week course, um, two cycles a year, and it fills up quite quickly. I think people quite like it. So again, it's Australian copyright law, but anyone can take it. And then my details are right there, and like Claire said, you're more than welcome to email me with any copyright questions that you have or call. Um, our website does have a lot of information, but it is sometimes people find it a bit overwhelming. So if you can't find your answer right away or if you just want to give me a buzz, just send me an email, you are absolutely more than welcome to any time. So thanks for listening. I know we covered a lot of material quickly, but again, if you have any issues or any questions, you're more than welcome to call me anytime. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica. You're welcome. Um, I think that we've probably all got some food for thought there, um, <laughs> if nothing else. There we go. I'm just doing back the. Uh, I think I stopped sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Now I'm just going to check that. There we go. Share my desktop again. There we go. Okay. Now I'm hoping that that all recorded. Yep, it did. Fantastic. You were so fast too. Well done. Okay, so let's uh, jump back on where we, we left off. Um, we were looking at downloading resources um, from the marketplace. Here is an old resource. So this is a flip chart resource. Um, and I can already um, See the rolling of your eyeballs and hear your groans from here when I tell you that if I want to download this flip chart to be able to 
uh, download it to my computer so that I can play it um, in Active Inspire or open it in Active Inspire, it's a two-step process. So my only option here is to add this flip chart to my resources. That's not my resources on my computer, it's not my resources in Active Inspire, it's my resources in Classflow. So I've got to click on this button to add to my resources and let's hope I've chosen a small uh, flip chart file so it doesn't take too long. Okay, fantastic, that was successfully added. And remember I said that um, there are often tool tips that pop up when you hover over things and you can see when I hover over that successfully added button, it prompts me to click here to go to my resources. I'm going to use this button. I could have used the tab at the top here um, because I am logged into Classflow, remember, and that will take me to the folder. It's actually a shortcut to use this button because it takes me directly to the folder where that resource has uh, downloaded to. So I'm in my resources and my marketplace folder. So over here, if I'd clicked on my my resources tab, you can see all of the things that I've got in my resources. I've got a lot of folders there that you wouldn't have because I've created um, quite a few myself, but I've got access to um, other resources that I might have stored on any of these cloud drives um, or cloud accounts, and I've also got access to um, other resources here. You will have uh, this showing in your resources too. So in the marketplace folder, I can now see two items which have just downloaded here. Okay, here is my flip chart and here is my equivalent fractions with denominators that um, you might recognize. I'll just move this out of our way um, as what I just downloaded, the new resource. Okay, so this one is ready to deliver straight to a class through Classflow. Um, this flip chart I've downloaded is a flip chart File. I can't play this to a Classflow class at this point in time. What I've got options to do is here, this little arrow on, on the right, I can download it. So I'm going to click that and you should hopefully see the lovely familiar little symbol there, multiplying fractions. Let me just double click on that to show you proof that there we go. It's opened in Active Inspire. It's a lovely Inspire flip chart. So you've still got access to all of those old resources. It's just a two step process to download it. But hey, if it's a choice between a two step process or losing the option to have all of those flip chart resources altogether, I'll take the two step process. Um, the next button along this little kind of reset looking button. Um, this is actually a really good uh, shortcut for you. Ordinarily, if I wanted to add a, a flip chart or convert a flip chart um, into Classflow, I would have to have it on my uh, computer and then upload it to my, my resources. So it's already uploaded here um, and I can just convert it into the right format. So I'll click that. Here's my message telling me it's building my new Classflow lesson. So it's converting this flip chart which I've downloaded so that I, I can then use that resource and play it in the right format for Classflow. Okay, hopefully that's going to be a nice quick one. Obviously depending on um, the size of the resource and, and the information that's within the flip chart will depend on um, how long that takes. I'm hoping it's not going to be terribly long. I'll give it a couple more seconds and then I'll just move on. Um, let me take a moment to just have a look and see if we've had any questions coming in. Um, Uh, some people are having problems with their audio, I think. Could be internet speed, maybe, at your end. Okay. Um, so 
So we can see here our flip chart is now a class flow lesson and it's ready to deliver. And um, where are we? There it is. So the difference here you can see in the symbol. This symbol for flip chart is a circle and it has the thumbnail of the flip chart uh, cover page on it. This little symbol here, this green symbol, denotes the lesson format, which is how um, you deliver a lesson or essentially a flip chart, um, a series of pages to your class in Classflow. And you can see over on the right hand side here a blue button. I can deliver that to a class. Okay. Now, one thing I'm going to um, point out, you'll see a difference between these two symbols. So this symbol here denotes a lesson. It's bright green. This symbol here also denotes a lesson, but it's faded and there's a little padlock on it. That's because the person who has created it chose to publish it. So I have the option sometimes to publish, um, which means that people cannot edit it or make changes to it. So what you might find with um, quite a few of the resources that you're downloading from Marketplace, just be aware that they might not be um, editable. Okay, now we sort of started in a little bit of a strange um, place. Uh, I wouldn't normally start with the marketplace when I am uh, introducing Classflow, but because we had the opportunity to have um, uh, Jessica join us, I thought it would be great to have her at the beginning so she can um, head off and do uh, what she has to do. She's a very busy lady. Um, and also, because of the changes with the Classflow and the Promethean Planet websites merging, I thought it might be uh, good to kick us off in the marketplace there. Okay, um, but let's come to our home screen here um, and go back to a bit of a more traditional overview of Classflow. Um, so, Claire, we just have a question here from Rachel, and this is just asking if it's uh, possible to sort of flip charts that the most downloaded on Classflow might be used to jump on it. I don't think so. I don't think that's an option. Let's just go and have a quick look, but I don't think so. These are your only options here. That's not, not available yet. I think you will. It might be something that comes. In the next release, yes, yes. If you want to suggest it, um, if you go to the forum, like the community, you can make suggestions and that could be something that you could suggest. Um, I haven't seen a roadmap, so I don't know if it's already on the roadmap for um, the marketplace, but it's certainly worthwhile um, suggesting that. Um, okay, so I'm going to jump to the home screen. Thanks, Yvette, for bringing that to my attention. Um, Okay, so one of the great, fantastic things about Classflow is that you have really great support on how to use it right at the tips of your fingers. I think Promethean um, have done a really good job here. They've built training videos into the platform so that you can instantly find out how to do or create something, no matter where you are or what you have selected. So you can access these little videos at any time by clicking on this little drop down arrow here and as I hover over it you'll see video help is the tooltip there. Now because we're on the home page I'm pretty sure we've got access to most of the training videos here. Now depending on what you have open, so my resources tab, the videos here will be about the my resources tab. If I'm on the marketplace, I don't think there's many, I think there's just one, there you go, one video on how to um, use the marketplace. So depending on where you are within Classflow, you'll see different um, videos there. But you can also access the videos off the home screen. So these are all of the different, I guess, categories of things you might want to know how to do within Classflow. And um, if you click on them, they take you to a, a 
place, you can scroll down to find them all, the one un underneath the other, um, where you can see how to do it. So how do I use the chat function? How do I um, use the teacher space? How do I uh, make a collaborative lesson or, or collaborate during a lesson? So um, you've got access to training or access to support at the tips of your fingers. Um, you've also got the um, big green question mark there, which is interactive help. And if you click on that, it basically opens like uh, an instant messaging um, option and you can type in here. So Rachel, you could even type that in and ask the question in case uh, you know, maybe the, um, it is actually, there is a way to do it in Marketplace um, to search search that way but not that I'm aware of. Uh, now interestingly when I came in here the other day it came, it popped up and it said there is an introduction to Classflow webinar being run tomorrow morning 7am Sydney time um, and I registered for that through this myself and I'm kicking myself that we weren't doing this on Thursday because then I could have used all their material. Um, Alright so um, loads of help to get you started yourself on here, which is something I really like. Now, as I mentioned earlier, initially Classflow started off as an idea to give some simple whiteboarding software in the cloud. Um, so we have a really simple, easy button up here, the instant whiteboarding button. It looks like a board with a squiggle on it, so I'm going to click on that now. And you can see that it's opened me up what looks like a page here. And interestingly, I think it's opened up and remembered some of my uh, last whiteboarding session, which is helpful. It usually, I think, opens you up just one card. And to add more cards, you use this plus symbol here. OK, and it's added a card. You've got a really simple toolbar um, over here. So you've got some tools. Let me just click on page one. You've got some tools here. Uh, I've got a pen tool. If I click on the pen tool twice, I can now change my colour and my uh, thickness of my pen. I can roll away this page browser part so it's not in my way. And let me just write up here. Uh, here we go. A little problem. Sorry about how slow it is. I'm on my uh, mouse keyboard. Um, okay. Uh, now, for me, the absolute coolest part of Classflow is the ability for me to quickly question my students at any time to get feedback. I can um, absolutely pre-prepare questions if I want to. I can pre-prepare lessons if I want to. But I can also do everything off the cuff, everything off the, on the fly, as I'm about to do here. Um, so let's put this to the test. You are going to be able to join my lesson. I'm going to click on this button here. Okay, this is how you would join students to your lesson. It's like a registration button. It opens up this information box. I'll just move that out of the way. Um, where you can see my class code. It tells you where the students need to go. All they need is a computer or a tablet device that has an internet uh, connection and a web browser. Um, I'm going to join the lesson. So can you go to, if you have a computer handy or a tablet handy and you're connected to the internet, could you go to www.classflow.com forward slash student. Let me do it up here. Get rid of that. Okay. Here we go. All right. Okay, now if you get a screen like this where it's blank, what you should be seeing is an option here to log in or to join a class. Just go up to the top left hand corner where you've got um, a little menu here and just log out. Okay, 
There we go. So you should see a screen like this. And then you're going to enter the code, which I think was Q6WH4. And I'm going to put my name. OK. And when you're registered, you should see something that looks like this. I'm going to pop back to my teacher account. Oh, handily, it's logged me out. Sorry about that. Let me just log back in. Okay, and I'll start my instant whiteboarding session again. Oh, I've got two, two connections. So it's remembered my connections. I've got Wendy. Hello, Wendy. Thank you for being able to jump on. I'm also going to join my iPad, which I've got over here. Q6WH4. I'm going to have at least three students, I hope. And I'll call this Bob. Here we go. That should join. So anyone else that, oh, good, Judy, John, great to see you. Oh, look at them all. Look at you all there. That's great. <coughs> okay, so I'm just going to quickly write up, while you're all joining there, um, I'm just going to quickly write up um, that problem again. I can't remember what I wrote, but it's something like this. Oops. I think I saw someone pop up trying to join, but it's taking a little bit of time. And that is the one downside, I guess, of uh, Classflow. You are reliant on the internet um, and the speed of the internet. Now, for me, I'm quite lucky because I've got a little 4G modem that I'm running off sitting right next to me with full reception. So I'm reasonably fast on my computer here. Uh, now depending on your internet connection at your end is how fast or slowly things will travel backwards and forwards between us. Okay, so I'll just give people maybe half a minute more so that I can find where I was up to. All right. Okay, it doesn't look like we're having anyone else join us. We've been sitting on 14 for a little while. All right, so um, back here on my teacher whiteboarding screen, I'll just roll that away so it's a bit bigger for us. Um, maybe I want to do a quick check-in to make sure of the level of understanding before I move on to a harder concept, or perhaps I want to gauge the methods that my students are using. So I'm going to ask this question to you all in, oh good, a couple more have joined. Maybe just watch, Amy, if you're unable to, to log in. Sometimes the internet is just like that. Um, and it could be, oh no, we've still got people joining, I think. Um, right, so the button on your toolbar that will start the poll is the one that looked like this. And when I click on it, you'll see I've got all of these different types of questions that I can ask my students. So I'm going to ask you guys, first of all, a numeric input question. That means that when the question comes to you, the only way you can answer it is with numbers. All right, so I'm going to send that out to you. And for those of you who don't, don't have um, a connection, this is what the students would see. Okay, so this is my student view. Here's the card, so I can clearly see what's written on it. And in here, I can type my answer. Now, um, here we go. Down on the bottom right-hand side, there's a blue submit button. Remember, blue is the color for important buttons. And I'm gonna click that. And when I go back into my teacher mode, Okay, I can look up here and I can see that I've still got three students who haven't answered yet. So three pending responses. So out of 17, I know 14 have already answered. Now if I hover over that, ooh, goody, now only two pending. I can click on it and it's going to take me out to where I can view the assessments 
and the polling responses. Okay. Now this is live because I haven't um, exited out of my session. My polling session is still going. What you'll find is that you can, as students, delete your answer and resubmit it. And I'm really hoping some people will get it wrong, which I can see someone has very kindly done. Was that me? Might have been me. Uh, okay, I'm going to add another one. So if you have a go at, at changing your answer, let me show you what that would look like. Okay, I just highlight it, type in something else, and send it. Okay, and it will have changed here. Oh, good. Some people are getting some crazy answers now. Now, you'll notice that it's automatically on anonymous mode, so that if I want to do this and look at the results whilst uh, uh, I might be attached to um, the front of room device if I'm at all worried about my student's reaction to seeing their own name, I can leave it. If I want to see their names, which I do, and the kids often love to see it too, or most of the time love to see it, we can see here what their answers are. Oh good, Chelsea's on. Okay, now next to the toggle names button, it's got three options for how we can view those results. Okay, so I quite like the graph. Now, if you change your answers now, this is a lot more um, obvious when you're changing. I quite like this idea for um, if you're doing a debate, if you have the poll open, and as the teams are arguing their side, if you've set it on a yes, no, don't know um, poll, you can see the, the worm moving, if you will, how, how people are swaying towards one answer or, or another. And we can also view the results as a pie graph. Okay, like so. So that's quite, quite nice. Now, if I want to exit out of the view of seeing the results page, I do not use this button here. This exits presenter mode. This will take me back into class so it will exit my lesson. What I have to use is this tiny little X up here. Well, it's not tiny, but I have to use that little X there. Okay, and then I can I can now stop my um, poll. Now that it's stopped, you're unable to change your answers. What, whatever your last answer was, that's it. Okay, so Bob has uh, sorry, Claire has uh, no option to change her answer here. All right, um, I'm going to send that poll out again to you because what I want to show you is my favourite type of question or my favourite type of poll, which is the creative poll. <coughs> the reason I love it is because I think it opens up a much wider scope for the information or feedback I'm going to be getting from my students. So if I um, click to the student view, what you'll see is the entire card has been sent out and the students now have a toolbar down the side that they can click on and use. So I've sent this card out to you and how I'd like you to answer is I'd like you to show me your working out. What method are you using to solve this? So it could be you know, Claire might be a keen user of number lines, so she's going to write 24, and then she's going to show me how she's gone 2, 4, 1, or whatever method she's using, crazy as it is, and so on, until she gets to her answer of 29, and then she can submit that. Now you'll notice that there's also um, a camera option here. Um, maybe you've got students who use concrete materials. They might have some Unifix cubes or something like that on their um, desktop. They've used those to uh, visually work out or physically work out the answer. They could use that camera to take a photo and you have the option of taking a photo and uploading it. Um, or taking it instantly. So depending on how your tablet or your device connects, um, you've got two options to answer. Now I'll, I'll click on view the results and what you'll notice, 
I'll just move this out of our way again. All of your results are coming up down the bottom and I can see everybody's different methods here and I can just scroll along. Ooh, that's a pretty one. Um, and if I want to view someone's, I just click on it. Now again, it's automatically in anonymous mode and if I want to, I can see people's answers here. Okay, so I might pick on Rachel and I'm going to add Rachel's card to my lesson. So I click on that button and then I'm going to come along here and I'm going to pick on Claire because I also know her and I'm going to add Claire's card to my lesson and so on. I'm going to pick on Amina. I like your hand, Amina. Okay and so on. So I've added a few people's cards to my lesson. So I'm now going to hop out of here where I can see the results. I'm going to stop the poll and as you can see I've now got all of those cards added to my lesson and where this can be quite handy and where the section card comes into play because at first you kind of think oh, I wonder what that's there for what you can do is you can drag these cards up onto here and you've got to move them in the little frame but you can compare answers next to each other so you use the section that's one way you can use the section card there might just be a header or something like that where you've broken up your lesson but they're also quite good for pulling those pages on to compare Okay, um, I could also, if I wanted to, then send out, let's say, let's bring it up large again, I could send out that card to students to have a look at. So maybe we're talking about this methodology. There's a button here on my toolbar. It's not going to give me the hover over. Why? Oh, maybe because I'm on there, I'll close out and I'll close out. That's why. All right. I can now send this card out to the students. I could send it out as a poll, a creative poll, and have students add to it. But if I just want to, them to view it, I can use that little arrow and it sends just the card for you guys to have a look at. So if I go to my student, now Claire can really clearly and easily see that card up close, which is quite good, if nothing else, for um, visual impairments or being able to read the material on the card um, clearly. Okay, so we're in a huge hurry today. Um, we've almost reached the hour mark already and we've barely covered anything. So um, I'm going to exit out of our instant whiteboarding session. Ooh, before I do that, I just want to show you that at any time during the session, I can come back and have a look at those results. And um, it shows me all of the different polls um, that we've done. Okay, so there was our... Um, Oh, I've taken my ones from earlier today. There were our results there. Okay. And our creative results there. So I can view them at any time. All right, I'm going to exit out of here. And we're going to jump into the My Resources area because really quickly I want to go over um, how you would create or pre-create your own lesson. Um, in my resources there's a great big blue button up here on the left, it says new. If you click on it, these are all of the different types of um, activities or items you can create and down here this is where you can upload or convert files that you have on your computer. So if you had uh, smart notebook files or flip charts and you use them already but you want to use them in class flow so that you can use the polling over top of them, 
then all you would do would be to click on these and upload them. Just be aware that Classflow, um, remember I said it was originally intended to be a really basic and simple whiteboarding software. Uh, as more and more people have used it, and the people who are used to the really gutsy, comprehensive softwares like Inspire and Smart, they've said, oh, why can't it do this, and why can't it do that, and I want this tool, and I want that tool. And so Classflow has evolved um, in its capacity or, or functionality, but many things that are part of Smart or flip charts, for instance, won't copy across yet. So things that do copy across, things like sound, um, drag a copy or clone on drag, and a few of the actions, they will copy across, but you won't probably have full functionality if you've got really fancy flip charts that you use. So just be aware of that. All right. Obviously, I'd love to go through how to create all of these types of things, but we can't. We're just going to have a very, very quick look at how we would pre-create a lesson. So I'm going to click on that. Um, I'm going to give it a title. And I'm not going to fill in any of this information, but obviously, the more information you, you give here, the better um, for yourself and for other teachers that you might be sharing your resources with. Okay, and you can see here, I've essentially got a document. The document is called a lesson. It's got cards instead of pages. They are essentially pages, but they've decided to call them cards. It opens with one card and one section header. Here's a plus down here. You can simply add more cards or add more section headers. Um, Everything's fairly intuitive. You'll notice that as I hover over them, I've got cogs. So if I click on it, you'll see that I can change backgrounds. For instance, here we go, I'll just choose that top one. Blue button at the top right, select, and it's changed the heading. Okay, I can rename that. Maybe I'm going to call it Grammar Term 4 Week or something. Yep. If I hover over this, I've got lots of options. I can um, change my background. I can duplicate the card. I can anchor everything that might be on the card. Anchoring is locking. So if you're an Active Inspire user um, and things are locked on the page, anchor is uh, that. I can add card notes. I can add questions to the card here. We'll look at questions um, up here though. So along the top, I've basically got a very, very simple toolbar. Um, I've got some text. I can add text. I can change. I don't have a, a heap of fonts that I can choose from, um, but that's quite nice in some ways. So here's my text box. I can stretch the text box if I wish. Um, uh, if the verb is running, what might the adverb be? Okay, so this is just a piece of text on the page. That's not a preset question. If I wanted to, I could put a preset question on the page by clicking here or by clicking here. We're going to add a question in a moment, but uh, you can also add shapes if you wish to, so the type of shape, the fill colour, uh, the outline colour, and you'll notice there's a transparency slider and white line width here, um, and of course the line type for the shape. Uh, you've got some really simple tools here that you can pop onto the page for using. Um, but what I want to draw your attention to is this line of stuff up here. In particular, insert. If I hover over insert, you'll see I can toggle to my resources. And this is where I can access resources that I've already uploaded, like this one here. Okay, I could insert him into my page like so. All right, I'm going to oops, delete him though. 
don't want him there. Um, what I wanted to show you was this uh, drop down menu here that you might overlook allows you to search for images, YouTube videos, or web pages. Now, bear in mind if you've gone to YouTube and you're putting a YouTube um, video in here, it's embedding it as a link. So we're good with what Jessica was saying on the copyright stuff. You haven't downloaded it to your computer, you're not playing it through that method. You've embedded a link into your card that you're delivering in the lesson. So you're all good. Um, let's go to thing images here and I'll just do sports day. Uh, that one looks good. And I'll choose insert. So it's gone and done a Bing search essentially and I can move this picture around the page. I could resize it if I wanted to with those little handles there. Um, I'm not going to. Uh, I will add a question to this page just to show you. Um, we're on the home stretch. Okay, so you can see I can add a question set to each of my pages. I'm talking about this page. I'm going to leave it as question set one, although I could change that title. Any information I put in here is sort of for my own uh, record. I'm going to quickly add a new question. The question type, you can see there are heaps of different question types you can use. I want to do a creative response because in this instance, what I'm going to ask my students to do is use your pen or text tool because they've got a toolbar to add as many verbs to the card as you can see happening in the picture. Okay. Now in this instance there's no right or wrong answer. What I'm hoping for is the kids will write around the edges all of the verbs that they might see happening like jumping, running, smiling, grinning, um, looking, whatever. Okay. And I'm going to click Save. And I'm going to exit the Assessment Builder. And you can now see that this card's got a little symbol on it for an assessment. And that means when I'm playing this uh, to my class, the question is already there. If I want to, I can absolutely not add questions here. I can do it off the cuff exactly how I did it when we did the instant whiteboarding session. But some, sometimes people like to be pre-prepared. Um, that's how you can do it if you wish. I'm also going to draw your attention up here to this collaborate button. We probably haven't got time to test this out, but I'll just quickly show you. If I push that button, basically what will happen is uh, you could take that link, you can um, put it in your web browser and it essentially lets you join my, did that go out to my class I wonder, I don't think I sent it out specifically to you. Um, it allows you to join in the lesson here and uh, that means that we can co-construct pages together. So we can be adding um, images, we can be adding text, shapes, any of the things that we see here you'll be able to add to the card uh, collaboratively with me. So we can essentially be building um, presentations and content together. Um, there's also a messenger um, option um, so that, I don't know that it's that one. Yes, I think it is. Um, so students that are connected to the lesson to collaborate, um, you're able to instant message. So we can be doing this, you could be in China, I could be in um, France, it wouldn't matter. We could be messaging each other instantly here um, as we are creating things here. So. That's something we'll look into in greater detail in another webinar.
very, very, very quickly want to um, show you the classes area. Um, this is because if I wish to deliver this lesson and I want to keep a record um, of the data, so I'm asking my students questions and I want that data stored against their name, I have to play it to a set class. Um, so up in classes, if I click on that, you can see here, I've got the option to add a class, which we'll do in a second. You can see down here all my uh, current classes I've got and my test run I did this afternoon. So if I add a class, I've got a couple of options here. Okay, we'll just call this test two. I can add a subject or a grade level if I want. And this is what I really want to draw your attention to. All right, there are two types of class. There's the student generated class. Okay, that's what Promethean recommend and they say is the most popular. And then there's the teacher generated class. So um, you can see there's a, a difference between them in the functionality. So if you want to have full functionality here of what's available to you in this version of Classflow, which I should have mentioned at the beginning is the free version of Classflow, then um, you would choose this option. One thing I want to uh, sort of point out, this is where it gets a teensy bit um, tricky for us or a bit sticky for us because we currently do not have a server to host information from Classflow in Australia and there's not one in New Zealand. So the servers that all of this information is stored on um, are in America and the Amazon servers and they're in America. So uh, the data sovereignty comes into play and if you've got any concerns around this then I suggest you seek advice from your school or your governing organisation be it diocese or local government or board of trustees um, because for the student generated class there's a lot more information that you have to give over about your students. So the students are going to need uh, an email address um, and things like that because they can essentially log in to their own Classflow account. Um, teacher generated class might be a better option because here, I'm going to choose it and show you, you are simply adding students and you can see here you're either copying and pasting or you're just adding their information. So you could um, essentially just use initials for students in your class if, if you're at all concerned about how much information and where that information is going. Okay. Um, you don't have to create classes. You can use just the instant whiteboard functionality of Classflow. But if you want to start making use of more of the functionality, then you're going to have to start creating classes. I'm going to leave it there because we're already over time. I know that it was a bit of a rushed session. We sort of covered a little bit here and a little bit there. But fear not, we're going to cover a lot more of class flow in the future. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Hopefully you've seen enough today to at least pique your interest um, and go and investigate it a little bit further yourself. Um, there are all of those videos available. Um, you can drop us a line at any time. We're really happy to help you out and answer any questions. So again, we've barely sort of hit the tip of the iceberg with what Classflow is capable of. But hopefully you've got enough to get you started. So thanks very much everyone for joining us today and uh, we'll see you next time.